Hello and welcome to the Module 7 Commentary video, Vital Records, Disaster Recovery and Disposition for LIS 886. As you prepare for the most ominous sounding commentary in this entire course, please take a moment to adjust your video and sound settings. If you encounter any difficulty in viewing this video, please contact me as soon as possible. Prior to viewing this video for Module 7, please read pages 151 to 175 in the Safety textbook. Also, please read the handout on Canvas called Destruction of Records, Your Legal Obligation by Donald Skupski. Directions on where to locate the handout will be available in your Module 7 to-do list, which is also posted on Canvas. Well, I'd like to formally welcome you to the week which may scare the living daylights out of you. It's the thing we never want to talk about, but we really should as RIM managers. It's, do our organizations have safeguard in place if, in the event of a disaster, something really bad happens? Even worse, do we know what records we possess that are mission critical? Disasters happen every day. Fires, floods, extreme temperature, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, a Sunday afternoon cocktail binge with college friends that gone wrong. Regardless of what might happen, and honestly it's a question of when, not if, you need to be prepared as a RIM manager to know how to react in the face of a crisis. In the words of Sophia Petrillo from the Golden Girls, picture, if you will, uh, Eastern Illinois University 2004. Eastern Illinois is one of my graduate school alma maters, and I applied for the graduate program in approximately April of 2004. At that time, I sent in my transcripts from undergrad, my essay, all the good things you know that it takes to get you into school. After I had submitted the documents, I was sitting in my residence hall room uh, at my undergraduate college and got a phone call from my mother to turn on TV. Sure enough, there was a building fire at Eastern Illinois University that had made the news, and it was in a building I really wasn't all that aware of, but come to find out, it was the main administrative building for the graduate school and all of the other departments that came along with that. As such, all of my records that I had just spent a month putting together were burned in this fire. Approximately three weeks later, I got a, a, a letter from the university stating that because of the devastating fire, they lost all of my records and I needed to resubmit all the information if I wanted to be considered for admission. This is just one example of uh, a disaster that can occur at an institution. This one just happened to touch personally with me, uh, but it was a really odd situation because all of my records were burned up along with everybody else's. They lost approximately 30 years worth of data that was on paper. It was a horrible situation that I hope no one ever has to go through and something that they still actually talk about to this day on that campus. So just keep in mind, when you think things aren't going to happen to you as your organization or maybe you won't be impacted as a person, these things can happen, okay? So uh, just, just keep that in mind, uh, your, your instructor's records going up in flames when you try to think about uh, disaster recovery and all the things that should go along with that to help prevent uh, basically a meltdown if that should occur. In the text, Safety calls out the definition of vital records, which you will find on the screen. It's important to know that vital records are es essential to the organization's mission, and without them, uh, the organization essentially cannot function to its expected capacity. In education, this would be the equivalent of having a student information system with all the grades, account balances, and registration permanently erased. In medicine, it would be the equivalent of losing all patient files and insurance information. In banking, it could be the loss of all transaction records. I'm sure you get the hint that each organization has a set of records that, with a loss, would be completely crippled in day-to-day -day operations. Keep this definition in mind as we go through the module and explore the facets of vital records management and disaster recovery. As you can see, there are six important considerations which should be covered in an effective vital records management program. First and foremost, your senior management needs to acknowledge and place high organizational importance on creating and effectively managing a vital records program. This endorsement should be written and then formally conveyed to all members of the organization, regardless of rank. 
Next, and most ideally, the responsibility of the Vital Records Program should be delegated to the RIM Department. Granted, the RIM Department will collaborate with IT, legal, and other areas, but the RIM Department needs to be the responsible program unit. While each entity at the organization has a stake in Vital Records Management, the RIM Department is really best equipped to remain unbiased in the process. Next, with approvals in hand, the work turns to the identification of Vital Records. We'll talk more about this shortly, but essentially you can identify vital records during an initial records inventory. Once vital records are identified, you must perform a risk analysis. This analysis will determine which set of records are most likely to be damaged and therefore must be protected at the highest priority. Then, with the risks analyzed, a vital records program must implement safeguards such as co-locations, IT firewalls, or other uh, ways such as imaging to keep vulnerable records safe. Finally, the loop must be closed on the vital records program by training employees on how to protect vital records and then creating a, a robust auditing function to ensure compliance. Does a vital records program require a lot from the organization? Initially, you bet it does. However, with a solid vital records program in place, organizations will have the peace of mind in knowing that if the locust descends or plague starts spreading, the damage will be minimized. One of the skills you must master to be an effective RIM program manager is learning how to communicate and gain the buy-in of your senior management. The stark reality is no matter what your career path would be in librarian information science, whether that be a RIM manager, an archivist, a librarian, etc., you will need to compete for scarce resources. Also, you must be able to persuade those in power to give you the approval to make the decisions which can impact multiple program units. In creating and executing a vital records program, you must tap into the power and persuasion of senior management to make the program work. Much like launching a RIM program, a vital records program will require a level of decision making and buy-in from the organization. First, make sure your argument to senior management as to why the vital records program is needed includes talk of avoiding negligence. Can you imagine having a devastating fire which was caused by something in the organization's scope of control and then having to explain to investors, suppliers, customers, students, or a similar group why all of their records were destroyed? In our litigious society, a situation where you couldn't rebound from that level of de devastation is just asking for a lawsuit. Also, make sure senior management is aware that a vital records program will assist in compliance with federal, state, or local rules. Uh, although there may have been thought given to these items at the organization in a standard RIM program, uh, make sure that you think about what happens in the event of an emergency. Also, an argument must be made as to how the organization will continue in light of a disaster. If a major flood soaks all your files or an outbreak of H1N1 occurs and employees have to work from home for extended periods of time, do you have a plan? What would that look like? Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you must think like a public relations person. I'm sure you never imagined a degree career path in LAS would lead you to having to think about marketing and image, but you really can't get away from it. How would you look if a major tornado hit your hospital, like in the case of Joplin, Missouri in 2011, and x-rays and test results were found 40 minutes away, blown away by the tornado? Would you want confidential diagnoses being blown around on paper into the next town? All of these things uh, you need to consider as a RIM manager and should be discussing with your senior management when it comes to vital records programs. So we've talked a bit about vital records program. Now, where do you start in getting ready to have and to execute the program? Well, listen on, my friends, and I will enlighten you. By the way, the picture you're seeing on the screen is from, I believe it's St. Joseph's Hospital in Joplin, Missouri, which is now no longer there, but it took a direct hit by an F5 tornado in 2011, and electronic, um, excuse me, paper medical records were blown 40 miles into the next town, and people were finding x-rays, MRI results, different things like that, in trees, all over parks, different things like that. Uh, because all of that stuff was on paper um, and because of the impact of the devastation, that's one of the side effects that they had to deal with. So keep in mind, these things do happen. First and foremost, we need to talk about what is an actual vital record. 
Defined, a vital record is something which an organization cannot do without and could not be recreated. For example, if an employee fills out a Form I-9 for tax purposes, it's filed in a box and then subsequently destroyed by a fire, you have a vital record if the item cannot be recreated with other outside entities or means. Now, if we extend this example, if you use a payroll management system and you input the I-9 data points like tax withholding, social security number, and different things like that, into the system, the paper could theoretically be destroyed and then recreated by an export from the payroll system. In that case, the Form I-9 is what we would call an important record. In other words, yes, it'd be a pain to have the employee fill the paper back out again, but they could do it and business wouldn't stop because you did know what the tax withholding preferences were and other key data points on that form are included in a different system which could be queried if the paper was gone. As a RIM program manager, you must keep in mind program units will argue with you that everything they have is vital. However, you must be able to hold the line, so to speak, and know which of those items are truly mission critical. If you haven't a clue what is mission critical for a program unit, make sure you ask what items could not be recreated in the event of a disaster. Don't take all answers on surface level. Do a little digging and find out if it's being stored in other places, in databases, in spreadsheets, different things like that because that will give you a true determination as to what is vital and what is important. As you begin to identify vital records and program units, be sure the six items found on the screen are recorded somewhere for reference purposes in the event of an emergency. It doesn't matter what the emergency is, your organization must be able to quickly know what is vital, how they're protected, and where to find the items. After you have a comprehensive list of vital records, you must then decide how to protect them. In the case of the Form I-9 for payroll, the decision might be to keep all of the forms imaged and destroy the paper copies once the digital image is made. In this instance, so long as you have access to your servers, you can continue to work in the event of a fire, flood, terrorist event, or other emergencies. You must also consider if the storage unit will be on local servers or in the cloud. For example, if your storage server for electronic images is in the same building as your administrative offices where the paper was held, and if a bomb or fire occurred and knocked everything out, would you be able to get access to your file servers, okay? In some instances, you may, be, you may have it to where you can't get to the office and then the electricity is cut to the building, meaning your servers are now rendered useless, okay? So, but think about it this way, if the items were in the cloud and you legally could upload them to some server in the cloud, you could gain access to the files remotely with a web connection, okay? So everything could be destroyed on your headquarter campus, but then still get to something through your web connection because the actual files are in the cloud. These are all things you need to consider in vital records program management. And again, your IT department is going to be absolutely invaluable when it comes to helping you think through some of these items. The text goes into great detail about risk analysis. You've read that there are two popular ways to assess the risk related to vital records, qualitative and quantitative. While I agree these are very important items to consider, it's sometimes hard to come to a definitive conclusion on which record series are more risky than others. One of the most useful things to do in analyzing risk is to perform, in my opinion, something called a tabletop exercise. In such an exercise, key program unit leaders assemble around a table and talk through a possible disaster scenario. So this could be, again, a terrorist attack, a, a live active shooter, um, some kind of fire, flood, different things like that. In this exercise, it's easy to quickly identify the vulnerabilities in the organization and make a list of necessary responses in rank order. While it seems hokey and extreme to perform such an exercise, I guarantee organizations which faced 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, the Joplin tornado, <clears throat> or the Fukushima Japan tsunami, which they had spent more time focusing and wondering on the what if, rather than playing defense <clears throat> in the case of an actual emergency event. In the end, be sure everyone at your organization knows about the vital records program and its importance. This communication may come in memo form, training, or any other means necessary to get the message across to those folks. Regardless of your method, make sure it's very clear this program is a means to protect everyone in the event of an emergency. 
Also, be sure you're auditing and reviewing the program details on at least an annual basis. Program units add record series, threats emerge, and the world changes, so you must be sure that you've considered all of these items and that you're constantly reviewing your program to make sure that it's current and relevant. Before we conclude our discussion today, let me quickly transition over to the topic of disposition. As the last phase in the records life cycle, you will be called upon to get rid of records and other items at some point. The article provided to you by Skupski does a great job in highlighting many of the legal obligations and options relating to disposition. So be sure to read the article and be familiar with the options available to you depending on the medium of the record. However, let me briefly give you some real-world guidance when we speak of disposition. Though you will not find this in any text considered a Toddism that I hate paper shredders. They're little devil evil machines that constantly clog, burn out, and are a waste of money. For the amount of money you're going to spend on purchasing shredders for program units, do yourself a favor and contract with a shred vendor. Here's why. It's cheaper and it's more secure in the long run. Take it from a rim manager actually practicing, these are very true things. If you hire a vendor, they will supply you with locked bins which can collect a massive amount of items which need to be destroyed. In those bins, you can put paper, you can put optical discs, you can put anything in those bins and they will be ultimately destroyed. Then, when the bins are full, the vendor comes and securely picks up the items and literally shreds, crushes, and does everything to make them into a bloody pulp. If you're ever sued and questions arise as to how you destroy your documents, you can calmly and confidently say to the litigators that you have a professional outside firm handling all of your destru destruction and no shredders were used within your organization. Granted, if you can't afford an outside company, and you'd be surprised that you probably could even on the smallest budget, you will need to get a shredder or two, but make sure you carefully weigh your options. Next, I would recommend shredding, destroying, deleting everything over simply just throwing the items in the trash. Yes, yeah, some things you probably could just throw away, but as we've read, records sometimes have an odd way of ending up in parks, plucked out of dumpsters, or other odd scenarios that you've never even thought about. Do yourself a favor and shred and just delete everything when it comes time. Uh, obviously, unless, of course, you're supposed to keep it permanently. Finally, keep on your toes when it comes to shredding. As the article states, don't fill out a, a records disposal certificate saying that you've destroyed the item only to toss it in a closet and wait for the intern uh, to get there to do it as a project that they'll get to later. As mundane as destruction of records may seem, it's so important to complete the life cycle of the record and keep yourself out of possible bad press and litigation. This concludes the Module 7 Commentary on Vital Records, Disaster Recovery, and Disposition. If you have any questions or would like to more information or to discuss the elements of the commentary, please do not hesitate to contact me directly.